So welcome this evening. I'm Laurel Bongiorno, and um, I'm, uh, I know a lot of you because I'm an early childhood person, but I'm also the Dean for the Division of Education and Human Studies at Champlain, and it's really our privilege to um, have you all here and to be collaborating, having the MED program in early childhood education, collaborating with Basie once again to bring a spring speaker uh, to campus. So um, I want to just say a couple of things. You know, we're going to have a commercial break for a moment. Just make sure that um, you know what's happening at Champlain in regard to early childhood education. We. Um, you probably all know that we do have a dual endorse endorsement program, so undergrad students have early childhood and ele elementary education um, endorsements at our bachelor's level, but we also have our new um, MED program in early childhood education. And um, I was the program director for that, and then I was promoted to dean, and Robin Ploof stepped in as the interim program director for the year, and I'm happy to announce that after a national search, Robin is the permanent program director. <laughs> for that position, we looked all over the country and we found her right here on campus. <laughs> who knew? So um, I'm gonna introduce Sharon Adams, who will introduce Tweety. I'm very excited tonight. It's my honor and pleasure and privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, this is probably the only time I'll refer to her as this, as Dr. Tweedy Yates, because usually she's just Tweedy. Um, but Tweedy has um, a lot of professional, uh, I'm losing my train of thought already, professional experiences that I'll talk about first. Um, that she has her PhD in special education. She's a research assistant professor at the University of Illinois. She was the co-project director for CEPHAL. I don't know how many people know CEPHAL, the Center for Social Emotional Foundations of Early Learning, um, which we now refer to as the pyramid model. Um, she's also been a home visitor and a teacher, so she knows early childhood from all the levels. Um, and most importantly, I think, is her, the work that she does as a trainer. And I met Tweety nine years ago, um, and I remember being very intimidated at first because she was the co-project director of CEPHAL, and I was doing CEPHAL training, and she was watching me. Um, but what I learned about Tweety very quickly is how comfortable she makes people feel, that she's generally interested and cares about the people that she works with. I also, she's been in Vermont as a um, helping us get our Cephal model off the ground on a statewide basis. And I remember that I still think of her as that she belongs to Vermont. But then I found out she does this in other states and they think that she all belongs to them too. Um, and I haven't the heart to tell them that she really prefers Vermont. So, so Tweedy's been in Vermont a lot. Um, she's also um, one of the faculty members for the Head Start National Center for Quality Teaching and Learning where she does quite a bit of work now, traveling around the country, helping people with school readiness um, and family engagement around school readiness. So I'm very happy to introduce my friend to you tonight to enjoy Tweedy. I always think it's funny, who could be intimidated by someone named Tweedy, right? I mean, <laughs> really, that's just funny to me. But, um, one thing with tonight, you know, since it's night and everybody's been working all day, I wanted to do this in a way that would be fun for all of us, but also really make us think about what kinds of things we do, what kinds of things we have in place that really support the social emotional development of infants and toddlers, as well as how we can help parents. So how do we share this information with parents? How do we support parents in what they're doing with their own children? So this is going to feel a little funny, but I want to pass something around where it gets to everybody during our time together so you can see it. We're going to talk about this at the very end, but if I wait till the end, there's no way it, people can look at it. So what you will see is there's a family routine guide with a blue cover, and this is really two to five-year-olds when you look at it. There is a 
gold covered one, which is, it has a toddler piece in it and preschool. This one's center based. So it takes typical center based routines and different behaviors you might see. And then it gives ideas for things you can do. That's why I wanted you guys to see it. It's a really good resource that you can pull pieces from. You can also share it with families. So this one is family routines. The blue one, the gold one is for center based. And then Tennessee, they put together one for infants and toddlers since this one really covered two to five and it's really more preschool focused. So one thing I want to point out though, because this always bothers me a little, so I have to say this. Um, on this one, you will notice when you look at it, it has some great ideas in it, but it says, um, what do, what do I do to prevent the problem behavior? And as I was looking at this, a lot of the behaviors are just typical developmental challenges that infants and toddlers go through. So yes, it may be challenging to us, but it's not really challenging behavior. But there's still lots of really good ideas in here. So I just, I wanna pass them around and we can keep them together because it's the same format. So once you look at one, you'll kind of see what they look at look, look like. So you might wanna look at the center base and one of the family routine ones just to see the difference in resources. They're all free resources that you can download. So that way everybody will get, to, you'll know what we're talking about when we get to that part. Okay, and I am really excited to be here. This is the first time I've been in Vermont in probably five years maybe? Would it be that long? No, four. four years? Four. four years? So it's been a while, so it's really fun to, to get to come back to Vermont and see everybody. Okay, so we're going to talk about a recipe for success. And as we do that, I want you to think about um, your role, whether that's as a provider or a parent, because you may also be a parent. So any adult in an infant and toddler's life, okay? All right, here we go. <laughs> Through his eyes. It's really hard to be me, right? Okay. I depend on you for everything. In fact, I can't make it without you, which is so true. Infants and toddlers are so dependent on the people in their lives to even exist, right? So we're all really, really important in their lives. Okay. I need you to be crazy about me, even when you're tired and can't figure out what I want and need right? Because you've seen that saying, and I have it in here later, but every child needs someone who's crazy about them. So we want somebody, some adult in their life to be the one that's crazy about them. And sometimes that is hard when you're exhausted and you're tired and you've had no sleep and you can't figure out what they're trying to tell you, but we still need to be crazy about them and love them. Okay. There's so many things to learn and figure out. Help, and then, is there a how-to book about me around here? So if I only came with an instruction book, right, it'd be a whole lot easier. And the other thing I think that as we think about that, this quote, we are mirrors for a baby that tell him who he is. We're also windows that let him know what to expect. And you think about how true that is because every interaction that babies have from the very beginning of life start forming who they are and what their expectations of, are, of the world are. So how we interact with them lays the foundation for what they expect of themselves in the world. So again, really paying attention to what our role is with different infants and toddlers and how we're interacting across infants and toddlers and how we're supporting parents in doing that. So it would be really nice if there was a recipe for success where it really was do step one, two, three, four, five, add these ingredients, it'll be wonderful, you know, this child will be successful. But as we know, it doesn't work like that. But social emotional development has often been referred to as the secret ingredient because that really lays the foundation for infants and toddlers to be competent and confident across the different developmental domains. So we're gonna really focus on that area tonight. And there's one thing I want you to listen for as we talk and do some things and think about this. There's a main ingredient to this recipe that as we talk, listen for it. And then at the very end, we're gonna go back to that and see what you think it is. And really and truly, the recipe won't work without that main ingredient. So see if you can figure out what the main ingredient is. And just to think about 
What do we mean by social-emotional development? So what kind of skills are we talking about when we think about supporting social-emotional development for infants and toddlers? And if you look on this first side, that's more kind of the infant-toddler. And then the next side, the, the one where you see the continuum over there, is when we've laid that strong foundation for infants and toddlers, kind of the skills that they have then when they hit preschool. So that learning that capacity, building that capacity to form relationships, and again, that depends on us and our interactions and what those interactions are like. How to express emotions, or just starting to figure out how to express emotions. To learn how to self-regulate in different situations. To feel safe in, in their environment so they, they feel that security, that, that sense of being able to explore and learn, and that's okay. And to start develop, developing that emotional literacy piece, so where they really start to figure out some of those emotions. And when you do that as infants and toddlers, then when they get to preschool, they're feeling pretty competent and confident about things and who they are. They also, because of those relationships that they've had the opportunity to develop as infants and toddlers, find it a little bit easier to make friends when they're in preschool and persistent tasks. They stay with it long enough that they really can master a skill. Following directions, that's a little bit easier for them too. And then this, this whole journey around becoming emotional literate, they continue to grow and strengthen that skill as well as start to manage their emotions better and really start to be pretty empathetic and start to understand what others are feeling. Now, if you think about all those skills, it's not surprising that some children just go, seriously? Because, let, let's go look, look at these again. As adults, we still struggle with some of these developmental areas. You know, you, and even you have those days where you just feel like something's a little off, but you can't put your finger on it. It's, it that's, those are tough, tough skills. And yet our expectations of infants, toddlers, and preschoolers are that, yeah, we can do this, they can get this, they can do these things. So that we really are starting to lay that foundation so they can continue to build those skills and that they feel competent and confident about being able to do that. Okay, the other thing, and we were kind of laughing about this earlier, is think about that process, that journey of developing these social emotional skills because it's challenging to be an infant and a toddler period, right? Developmentally. I mean, they go through stages that we, if we were doing an assessment on a child, we would think, oh, that's great. You know, they're, they're expressing their independence. They're doing these things. But if you're not doing an assessment on them and you're just in a room with them, it's very challenging and we forget sometimes, no, we really do want them to have those behaviors. We want them to be doing those things that are really challenging to us because that's what they should be doing as they're trying to figure out the world and navigate and negotiate, but it makes it really, really challenging. The other thing I think that's really hard and not just with social emotional, but across developmental areas is just when you think you start to understand a child, what do they do? They move to the next developmental level and what was working no longer works. So it's this constant challenge on how do we do this and how do we do it in a way that really supports their competence and confidence. So just this stage along developmentally can be really tough for us in supporting infants and toddlers. And then if we go back to think about how, boy, all of our interactions, everything we're doing, how we're responding, how we're comforting, how we're helping them regulate, that's how they're forming their view of the world. So it's really, really important for us to think about that. And another reason that it's so important is the, the more research that comes into the field, the more that we know, boy, it starts really, really early, and we're seeing huge disparities by nine months old. So when we have this amazing opportunity to support infants and toddlers, we have this, this great job and really can make a difference because we don't want children starting off at nine months where they're already falling way behind other children. Okay. So... When children miss those social emotional skills as infants and toddlers, and then they head into that preschool, 
age group and then heading into kindergarten. Research has shown us again that those are the children who you often see challenging behavior from because they don't have as many friends, they don't get as many positive comments from people, and they don't tend to do as well in kindergarten and later on. So it has big consequences for them really early. And why is this important to us? I put this picture over there because there, this happened last year. There's a little boy named Luke, and this was a program that I was visiting in Chicago. And I had been once before, and I was in Luke's room, and I, Luke was one of these little boys that just loves everything and gets excited about everything. But he gets so excited that when he, he decides he wants to go do something, it doesn't matter who's in his way. He just doesn't mean to do it, but he's just excited. So I, I noticed that the first time I was there, but the second time I was there, he was playing by himself because not many of the kids would play with Luke. So he was, too, getting ready to transition in, out of the, you know, into the threes. And he looked up, and there were these two little girls sitting in a, the little cubbies, and they had a cubby between them, and they both were just kind of talking, playing, and he looked up, and he saw them. He dropped what he had in his hand, and he took off. And he ran over, he knocked a child over, he knocked a block structure over. It is like this little tornado going through, you know. But he runs through, and he plops down right in the middle of those two girls, and he was so proud of himself, and he so wanted to play with them. You know what happened? They left. As soon as he sat down, they get up and they leave. But what did Luke hear? Luke, no. Luke, stop. Luke, we don't do that. Luke, say you're sorry. So a little while later, I was in the hall, and I was just walking down the hall, and there were two teachers, and I didn't know them, standing out in the hall, and they said, you know, Luke's going to be in one of our classrooms, and I don't want him. And the other teacher said, I don't want him either. And I'm thinking, he's two, and he has a reputation. And it's not a good reputation. And what's very sad about that is nobody was helping him figure out what to do. Everybody kept saying, no, stop, we don't do that, say I'm sorry. Nobody helped him figure out a better way to interact. He, all he wanted to do was play with the other kids. But the way he was doing it was not working for him. But nobody was helping him figure out a different way. So. You know, I walked past the teachers not knowing them, and I thought, I can't. I have to go back. I have to go back. For Luke's sake, I have to go back. So I went back, and, and we talked, and that actually we ended up putting some things in place for Luke, and um, it worked out great, and Luke's doing fine. It was literally a matter of somebody helping him figure out a different way to do what he was doing so he could connect with other children. So, And it wasn't intentional. They weren't intentionally not telling him that because as soon as they realized what they were doing, it's like, oh my gosh, we aren't. We're not telling him what to do. We're not helping him figure it out. We're just saying, no, stop, don't do that, you know? So he didn't know another way to do it. So making those kind of changes, then the Lukes of the world don't get into preschool or kindergarten where they're not doing well and they're not as successful because we've put some of those things in place for them. Okay. Okay, so let's start with our recipe then. So we're going to start with three cups of relationship building, but you got to make sure you use the love and attention every day brand, okay? <laughs> so we want to do this on a consistent basis for all children. And one thing that this always, this really strikes me, and I think we can use Luke as an example here too. Relationships are different from interactions because relationships, when you have a relationship with someone, you know what to expect from them. You know, you sort of have a memory. Now, it all started with interacting with that person because if you think about a special person in your life, it might be a parent who you've known from the beginning or it may be someone that came into your life at a later point, but you started by interacting, but it was through those interactions that you built that relationship. So the reason I think this is significant is because when we pay attention to the children that we have in our care, we often will have some children 
that we don't intentionally do it, but if we pay attention, those are the loops that we're spending our day and we say to them, no, stop, don't do that, say I'm sorry. You don't, you interact, but you don't have a relationship with them. You see parents doing that sometimes with certain children, of their children that are just harder for them to connect with. That's not building relationships, that's interacting. So that's that difference between being intentional about with a particular child saying to myself, wow, I gotta try harder to build a relationship with him because I'm interacting, but I'm not really taking the time to build a relationship. So that child may be a Luke that's not getting that from other places and he really needs that experience of having that relationship. Okay, here's another warning here. So I just said this, if you, if you find yourself spending a lot of time saying stop, no, don't do that, then that should be a red flag to you. Or if you see a parent doing that, because often as a parent, we just don't think about it. Just as with Luke, they weren't thinking about the fact that they weren't telling him what to do. They were telling him to stop what he was doing. So sometimes just sharing that kind of information with parents is a huge thing and can make lots of difference. Okay. So another really important point, in our recipe, we don't want to just put interactions. We want it to be relationship building, not just interactions that are happening. So what kinds of things do you do to promote the development of relationships? Just throw out some things. Anybody, so this could be regardless of what your role is. What kinds of things do you do to build relationships? Yeah, thanks. Ask the child what they're interested yeah. in, what they like to do. Yeah. So just showing interest in them alone makes them feel important, right? Talk to them on their level, model. Yeah, talk to them on their level, model. Yeah. Anything else? Ask them to do special projects with yeah. you. Yeah, because, man, there's nothing better than getting to do something special with a teacher or an adult. Because think how hard they try to get our attention. Sometimes not in a positive way, but they want our attention, so that's huge. Anything else? Just play in the mud. Play in the mud, yeah. <laughs> play. Just play, period, right? I mean, get down there with them and play. All right, great. So here's a, <laughs> how many of you are familiar with the bucket books? Have you filled a bucket today? Those, I love those books. There's a new one for families. Have you seen that one? It's really good, and it has just simple, like swinging together, taking a walk together, saying I love you. So sort of reinforcing for all of us, these don't have to be things that take a huge amount of time, but they have a big payoff, huge outcome. So even doing those little things like, you know, rocking, singing to a baby, eating dinner together, giving hugs, high fives, and then the trying to maintain a four to one. So four positives before you do anything that's a negative. And that with certain children will turn a behavior around just that alone. And it makes us pay more attention and be more intentional about the interactions that we're having with children. So some people have done things like, if there's certain children that are more of a challenge for them, you know those little um, aprons you get at like Home Depot and stuff that have the different pockets? They'll put like, they'll put four clothespins or something in one of them. So every time they say something positive to that child, they move it over. So they very intentionally know, I know I have a hard time with this child, so I can't say anything until I get all four of those clothespins moved. So just that really intentional piece. And I love this, um, this picture. This happens to be, this was my daughter who's now 33, but um, I, I love this whole idea of with children, with colleagues, with other people in our lives, this whole idea of have you filled a bucket today versus did we drain buckets today? We don't want children having to look in their bucket for a drop, right? Because that's what supports competence and confidence. And if we're not filling it up enough where they can feel that sense of who they are and that they're important, that means they literally are having to look for a drop somewhere. So it's another way just to kind of think about um, how many buckets we fill today. There was a program in Chicago who at the beginning of the year, they gave every, like all the teachers had little buckets in their rooms and the way they started every staff meeting 
and they had a little booklet to fill out was so they would share the kinds of things they had been doing to fill children's buckets to fill each other's buckets and then the parents came in and they were like what is this bucket thing because the kids went home and were talking about it so then they put buckets in the parents room and parents started putting drops in the teachers buckets and it literally changed the whole atmosphere of that program just people really supporting each other so it can be a pretty powerful thing that doesn't take a whole lot of time to do Here's something else that um, we actually did with playgroups and on home visits, but it's a fun thing to do in collaboration with parents, is we just gave out these little cards. They could pick one, you know, we had them at the back of a classroom, or you could have them at the back of a group or on a home visit, and parents would just pick one. And then we had, that's just poster paper, and this particular family put it on their refrigerator. But when they would do something with their child, like they went for a walk, they would pick up a leaf. And then when they got back, they would put the leaf on the refrigerator and then just write the word up under it. So you could later say, like if grandma came over or dad comes home, and you, you can point to the leaf and say, tell grandma what we did today. So it's a great language, literacy, supporting social emotional development, but supporting all these different areas at the same time. So. That, that's a really fun thing to do because, again, it reinforces, we're not talking big, it's not the big things that make the difference, it's the little ones. So that gives parents ideas, and then you can do those kinds of things in the, your center also. I have to point out, see the high buy? Can you see that? It's a little dark. So we were going, what's the high buy? They went to the park, and they sat on the, on the bench of the park, and they said hi and bye as people walk by them. So... That was kind of, it's, it's just a fun way to support that language, conversation, interaction piece with, between parents and children. Okay, so another thing that happens a lot is reading books together, right? And, you know, research shows that truly reading aloud to each other is one of the single most important activities for being able to be successful around reading. So we know that that's important for us to do in centers, but we also know that it's, it's important for parents to understand how that important that is. But I also, this always makes me think of this one family that we were on a home visit with, and the little boy was at that stage where he just wanted to turn the pages. And so mom would start reading, and he would turn a page, and she would go, no, and turn it back because she wanted to read all the words. She'd start reading. He'd turn the page. She'd say no. Go back, read up all the pages. So she got to the end of the book, and she looked at him, and she said, okay, you can turn the pages now. He looked at her with these big eyes like, I'm not touching that book. <laughs> and, you know, we thought, okay, this is how kids get that idea that books aren't fun. And there's been research that showed if, if by age six children aren't hooked into books, it's almost impossible to get them excited about books. Think about how hard that would be at six when we know the rest of our school life and just life in general, when you don't think books are a fun thing because of your experiences with books. So that, that was pretty significant, but talking to her afterwards, it made sense because she said, I've never been able to read very well when I go to the doctor's office, when I'm at the grocery store, on television, all they talk about, about is how important it is for your child to be able to read when they get to school. I just want him to be able to read. So every intention she had was good and right, but she didn't understand developmentally that turning pages is part of reading. So making the behavior of the child make sense to the parents. So why am I doing what I'm doing? And then they know better how to support their child when we share that information with them. Okay, so I want to show you this video, and I want you to think about how does this support social-emotional development? Oh, thank you. <laughs> how does this support social-emotional development? But what else is happening here developmentally? Is that too loud?
Okay, good video, right? So what was going on, let's do social emotional first and then we can just kind of shout out some things of other areas, but what social emotionally did you see going on that supported those kids? Yeah, shared experience. Happy giggling. Happy giggling, giggling. yeah. She's doing a lot of encouraging. A lot well. of encouraging, yeah. And to different kids. So she, yeah. you know, not just the scratching, but she would kind of say yes and give them time to say yes, those kinds of things. So supporting competence and confidence that way. Anything else? I think the fact that they, clearly they've done this before, mm -hmm. they knew this, that repetition, because what a great way to support competence <coughs> and confidence, because the kids knew what to expect. The other thing I think, and you guys can see if you think this, but I think the fact that they didn't have to sit oh. is okay if they walked away. Oh, yeah, yeah. There were other kids over there playing, I mean, they're toddlers, right? But they were so engaged in what was going on. The what little girl that went away for a second came back because, you know, so they go away, but it looks so much fun. I'm going back to, <laughs> to do with that. So to me, that's a way to support social emotional too because we're not trying to kind of developmentally get them to do something that's really hard for them to do. It's also looked like they were talking. Yeah. They weren't made to go from one area and then uh -uh. switch to the next area. Uh -uh. They came as they were Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So what other areas of development were supported here also? Their yeah, their listening skills. Amazing. It was amazing, yeah. But I think it shows you too, like having it engaged, being so engaging, that repetition of knowing what to expect, that you get them, you get them in there. What else? Yeah, vocabulary. Oh, great vocabulary happening. What? Movement, yeah, movement, which was fun too, and that again kept them there. Yep, yep. Because think how boring it would be if they were sitting and they weren't moving. That book wouldn't be nearly as much fun if you were doing that. So, anything else? Yeah. She elaborated on the storyline too with you know extra hand motions of you know the, the big teeth and the, the movement. So she did what was in there verbally or what was written, but she also extended. Hand yeah. Hand. Yeah, and did some of the movement too. So they got to see that modeling. Somebody said modeling a few minutes ago, but kind of you got to see what to do, how to do those things. So a great example of how that particular activity really supported her relationships with them too, right? You can tell the relationships that she has with those kids in that classroom. So a really positive example. Now we've even, we've used this sometimes as well as, because think about the parent, there have been so many parents that have said to us, no one ever read to me. I don't know how to read to my child. So being able to show them some videos or have them come in a classroom when you're reading, you know, just to know that it's okay if they don't sit still, if they don't stay there the whole time. But here's some things you could do to keep them engaged a little bit longer, you know, when you act it out more or you're, you've got that movement piece in there. So that's a great way to share some of those reading skills with, with families. We used to, um, when I was a nanny, I had the book, It's Not Easy Being a Bunny, you guys know that book, but it's the bunny tries to go live with all the other animals and tries to be all the other animals. And we read it was one of those books we read over and over and over again, and we knew it so much that we never had to read the book anymore. And um, when she was in the backpack, that was her request all yeah. the time. So we would tell the story and do all the motions while she was in the backpack. So. Yeah. I mean, that's just the, the power of that. It so. is. It's so powerful. Yeah. So figuring out ways to share that with parents is a huge yeah. positive thing for parents, too. And then I think going back to this, you know, when things are positive to us, we want to do it again. When they're not, when they're more negative, all of us, we don't want to keep going back to do those things again. So it's important that we provide opportunities for children where it is more positive for them. And the, the Lukes who, you know, he was always in a good mood. It's like he didn't, I'm sure he noticed that other kids didn't play with him, but he kept trying to play with them. So we don't want him to keep having those negative experiences because at some point he's going to stop trying or the behavior is going to escalate, right? So really thinking about across children too. Where, who, 
what kinds of things are creating positive experiences and which things aren't as positive for which children so we can figure out how to support them in doing that. You know, even that, the chewing books, uh-oh, the chewing books thing, because that, again, like, in when we do play groups, because a lot of the parents will say, well, I don't give him books because all he does is chew on it. It's like, yeah, but that's a, that's a, that's a literacy skill. That's a, you know, one of those early things. So making it make sense. And then I put this in here just because I think this is so funny, but true. Remember how hard it is to learn stuff. There's so much new stuff when you're little. So this is, he's got two alphabet books. And one says A is for apple, and the other says A is for apple. And then the other one says B is for ball, and B is for balloon. And he goes, I don't know what to believe anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> we forget sometimes how hard it is, I mean, how confusing it must be and how hard it is to learn all this stuff we're throwing at them too. So that's just kind of a fun reminder. One of my favorite books is Brown Bear. And I think it's, it's one of those books that if you read it enough to infants, they literally will bob their head to it while you're to the rhythm of that book. Toddlers love that book. Preschoolers love that book. It's just one of those books that you can do so much with. And I'm sure that you all, you, that DLTK website, because that's such a fun website, because you can download the characters of different books from that website. So, and that's why in your handout I gave you this, because I think this is a fun thing to share with parents. Because if they're older kids, they can color these together. Um, you can do all kinds of fun things, like for toddlers, because as you're reading the story, they can hold brown bear, or uh, maybe the only one I have on a stick. Nope. I got the red bird, too. So, you know, and they can, you can stick them in those little styrofoam little squares you can get so they can even stick them in there if you, if you want to or if you're reading to a group of children you know different ones can, ones can have them so these are great strategies we can share with parents too about how they can engage their child and then as they get a little bit more sophisticated in their knowledge they can match things but think of all the things you could do with brown bear so Take just a minute and talk to the person sitting next to you. And let's think about this from a social-emotional standpoint. But the fun thing is it shows how that social-emotional piece, we're focusing on that. But while we're doing it, it's that strong foundation because then they're learning so many other things because it's more of a positive experience for them. So just we're just going to take just a second. But just turn to the person and try to think of something fun you might do with brown bear, with the characters, or, or anything you might do with it. Okay, let's, let's share. So we're still on this kind of relationship focus here, but we're using books as a way to, to do that. So what are some fun things you could do around Brown Bear? Just throw out a couple of things people were talking about. Sign it for the kids. Oh, sign it. That's they, great. They get to be the different characters. That's a really, and what a great way to teach signs for, and, and you know, animal have, kind of thing, simple. Perfect. Yeah. Him. Yeah. But that's a, so that's a perfect relationship mm -hmm. example. Yeah. 
because that then makes it easier for them to interact with the infant and the infant to interact with them. So it's really supporting lots of different things. That's a great example. Anybody else got one they want to share? Yeah. I made homemade um, cell boards with yeah. the characters. Yes. And then just the book on the table. And yeah. They the love it. They don't usually even need the book. They just act it out yeah. all themselves. Yeah. And they're talking and <coughs> using language. And yeah. So I was in a, um, that <laughs> reminded me of not using the book, a classroom with toddlers not long ago, and there were these two little girls, and they each had books, and they were acting like they were reading them, like the teacher, you know, how they'll model that. And one little girl was just making up her own story, and the, ne the little girl sitting next to her kept going, that's not right. <laughs> don't do it that way. And I mean, it was so funny because she clearly didn't like, she wanted it more, you know, where it was the progression of the story. And the other little girl was just kind of telling her own story from the pictures. You know, it's like causing a few problems there. So, but that it again shows you that because of what the adult did in that classroom, those kids were engaged in that. They wanted to do it. They wanted to model that. So that's such a positive thing. Any other just fun idea you want to throw out that somebody talked about? Sounded like there were lots of fun ideas. We've done animal headbands. Yeah. Um, just having the kids create them and then um, reading the book and using those as props and whoever the blue cat can find the next character. Yeah. And they pull their friends up and then they switch. Spots. That's fun. Yeah. So and that supports interactions with other kids and stuff. So that's a great idea. Okay. So a few things we've done is. These are for families, but you can make the little brown bear book of everybody in a classroom so they can take them home so families also learn the other children's names in the classroom so they can talk to their children about them. But we also did them for each of the families. So this one was, you know, Tyler, Tyler, who do you see? I see Sissy looking at me. I see Mommy looking at me. I see Daddy looking at me. Grandma was there. Buddy. We included everybody. Buddy was there. But you could also do a little let's count everybody. It could be a math thing in a fun way that you could do. Or we made puzzles out of the, so put, um, I just glued them on cardboard and then put the contact paper over them. And then you can cut them just in half to make it easy, but then as they get a little bit more sophisticated with their skills, you can make more cuts and they can do it. So it's kind of a cheap way to do that. But we also did the, family members also, and you can put the letters up under, even though they were a little young for it, but they're seeing it, it's exposing them to those letters. So that was fun. And then you don't have to have the book we're going on a bear hunt, but how much fun is it in classrooms and at home to put, like we put the characters around the room mm -hmm. and they would go on a bear hunt. We just made these little things. They would go on a bear <laughs> hunt to find them. But that's a great way to reinforce vocabulary. You could do it with anything too, but things, parents could easily do that in home. They could just, at home, they could pick two things that they put somewhere, but they go on a bear hunt together mm -hmm. to try to find those objects or those toys or whatever that might be. And that's just, it's a simple thing, but it's a great way again to support that interacting together, but you're also developing lots of other skills. Here's one of, you may have made these. I love these. So these are so easy to make, but you put you cut the holes bigger and bigger so the kids try to guess what it is. You'll get it right off bear. because we just did brown bear. <laughs> but you can, you can put other yeah. things <laughs> under here. <laughs> but so they try to guess, and then it gets a little bit bigger, and they're still guessing. A little bit bigger. A little bit bigger. <laughs> and then you can, you know. So any, God, it's a great vocabulary kind of thing that you could do. <laughs> you could do it um, with kids in a classroom, you know, as they're learning each other's names. And literally, it's just stapled and then paper up here. But that's a fun one that parents can do also. But um, cheap little idea of things to do on, on anything you're talking about in the classroom or anything kids are interested in. So in your, um, in your package... You have these examples. This is another great way for involving families. And I just realized I didn't put the website on these where you can get them. So let me tell you where it comes from. This is from the Center on Early Literacy Learning. So the acronym is CELL. But if you put 
if you just Google sale, it goes to 9 million science things. So you really do have to put center on early literacy learning. There are tons of resources on that website if you're not familiar with that, but these are some new ones that they have. They're called POPs, and they're just little posters for parents. So these are things you could share. So, and they're, what's nice about these is they have infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, so they're really geared towards the different ages. But they're just fun little things. When we're talking about those little things that don't take a lot of time you can do with your child, then this gives ideas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, with Carol and Lisa tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. 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 And so it was really interesting to see these um, for parents. It's uh -huh. really well written and there's uh -huh. a wide variety. And I think there's something on there for teachers there is. as well to help to explain to parents what you would want yeah. them to be doing with their yeah. children. Yeah. So these are called pops, and they just give little pops of things that parents can do with their child. And they're like at the grocery store, meal time, those kinds of things. But you could easily sort of share with parents like in a newsletter or things you're doing in the classroom that they could do at home to sort of make that link. But I think what you're talking about, they have something called the cell practice guide. Yes. And, um, and so they have a set for practitioners and a set for parents. And they have tons of them. And while they're all, the focus is on language and literacy, everything focuses on either parent-child or teacher-child kind of activities. So they're like two-page little things, and they on the front of it, it tells why this is important. So a great conversation to have with parents about why this is important, why you're doing these kinds of things. Then on the back, it has three activities that either the parent can do with the child or that you can do in your program with the child. So it, it is a, it's an amazing website. But these are new ones that I think are great for sharing information with parents. Have the adaptation for, for special needs, uh huh. Like yeah. And even though they have that separate section on children with special needs, every single almost the, the third one on almost every single practice guide has some sort of adaptation yeah. on it. But um, it, it's a great one when we think about sort of pulling a parent child or teacher child together. I just realized um, it's already 724 and I'm on slide 35 of 89, so I might ought to speed up. Um, so in your packet, one more thing, and this is these are just kind of for fun, so we don't have to spend time on these, but I also gave you the little rhymes and finger plays. I just gave you the babies and toddlers, but there's also a preschooler part if you also kind of work across that range. But what I love about these, these are easy things you can do with a child or a group of children, and they're repetitive, and then families can do it. You can share it with families. You can download all this stuff for free from the web. You can just look it up, um, read, reading ready and it pops up. You can even put in rhymes and finger plays and it pops up. But So that's just a resource of, again, it only takes a minute, but it's a great way to pull parents and us with children together. Also, this is sort of, it's not in the right place, but on your very pack, back page, those getting to know your child, this type of thing, not this exact form, but getting parents to fill this out on their child at the beginning of the year and then you fill it out because it's kind of fun as a parent to know. So who are my child's favorite people when they're at the center? Who, you know, what are their favorite toys? Because it may be very different from what they do at home. So this is a great way to get that communication going back and forth. And it helps all of us focus more on individual children and what they're interested in and who they are spending time with and how they play with certain things. So that's just sort of a fun way to do that. Here's another really fun idea. And we've done this in classrooms as well as at home. People have done it. But you write, you take a t-shirt and you write special things all year long about a child. So they're all different because they're specific to that child. And at the end of the year, they get to take their, their little t-shirt home with them. But how cool is that to have a t-shirt when you're two years old that has all this really great thing about you? And if it's a parent who really has a hard time seeing the positives about their child, that is a great way, because it has stuff written all over it about all the great things about this child. People have also done the little boxes. That's almost like it kind of reminds me of portfolio assessments, because you put things throughout the year in that that child does, or they write, or that, you know, little special things that you might write, or other teachers might write 
to put little notes in there about the child, and then at the end of the year, they take their little box home that's full of information. But anything we can do like that supports that competence and confidence as well as those interactions. And I don't know if you've seen that book, You're All My Favorites, but it's a really cute book because you know how kids buy for your attention. They all want to be your favorites. It's a really cute book about You're All My Favorites. So. But Vermont's really your favorite. But Vermont's <laughs> really your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, I see a book in the making already. Okay. Uh, what, excuse me? Um, it's, you know, it's a typical, it's Sam McBratney, B-R-A-T-N-E-Y. All of those books are wonderful. The pictures in them and everything, they're great. There is a whole series of them, but that one's really cute. Okay, real simple thing, and we've kind of talked about this even watching that reading. One thing that you can do to make children feel important is follow their lead. You were saying that. What you're in, talking to a child about what they're interested in. Just They love that. It makes them feel really, really important. Infants, you can watch infants. If you start imitating them, look at the look they get on their face. I mean, it's kind of like, whoa, do you see what I can make her do? And then they start trying. They'll make different sounds to see if you're going to copy them. So it's a really simple thing but really powerful, again. Okay, um, and then those things we do like All About Me because that's a great way to really build on what children do. This was an idea that this child was born premature when his mom went back to work. She literally took a little book about Jack to her child care provider and said, this is Jack's grumpy face, this is his nervous face because she wanted the child care provider to kind of have some idea of how her child let, lets you know certain things because she was really nervous about going back to work. And the child care provider thought it was such a great idea that she started taking pictures of Jack and she would send them then back to mom saying, this is Jack's happy face or this is Jack's <laughs> nervous face, you know, when he's here. So that was a really fun way. And if you have a parent, if you're especially like a, in an infant, well, toddler also, but that you know that the parent has a hard time reading the child's cues and really misses a lot of cues, that's a great way to kind of start building on that, you know, making it in a fun way, learning about that particular child, how he, he communicates, how he lets us know things. Okay, and then, you know, doing those things that we often do where we measure children, you'll go in houses and see where people have literally, their kids are grown and gone and they have the little marks on the wall, but, add a piece here. Every time you measure them, so at whatever you know period of time that people decide to measure them, you write something fun about that child that they're able to do at that point. So it adds that little extra piece on there is a great way to do that sort of thing. And then making books out of routines that you do. Um, we got to get off this relationship. We only have three cups of relationship building at the moment, so we got to <laughs> hurry with our recipe here. But the other, p if we think about relationships, we have to think about friendship skills too. And we talked about how we interact with infants and toddlers really helps them lay that foundation for what to expect from other people as well as to feel more competent in interacting. So doing some of those things like just providing infants opportunities to watch other children. You know how they will literally sit there and watch them go by and thing That helps them develop those skills. You know, copy other children. When they want what others have, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, practice turn-taking. Sharing is that thing that's always that, but they're not quite there yet. You know, you've all seen this one. But this is a fun <laughs> thing to share with, to remind ourselves of sometimes as well as share with parents because it is that I may have had that toy an hour ago, but it's still mine, right? And that's kind of what we expect from the toddler. Okay, um, and then just those things like setting up opportunities for toddlers to do things together. Those tight materials like the little rocking boat, where if you have a child that has a hard time interacting, that puts them face to face with just one other child. So it's not quite as overwhelming for that child and you can be right there to support them. Reading books about friends, having some of those, this is a tube box that kids love. It always draws lots of kids around it. They love it and you can do all kinds of things because you can have different size tubes. So some things will fit down, others won't. But it's a great way for kids to have to negotiate being around other kids and how you do that. So really thinking about the kinds of things you put in your environment that support that. And then practicing. 
You know, people will do the blocks with the kids on it so they literally can have conversations with each other. Or the they took pictures and laminated them and then stood them up on the little metal clips. Yes. I kind of thought the head thing was a, a little creepy when I saw it in the classroom. <laughs> but the kids loved it. The kids love like changing heads and outfits. But that's the first time I had seen the heads kind of different from the... <laughs> but they seem to like it. So, you know, the sharing issue again. Developmentally, I think that's always such a tough thing because I think a lot of, a lot of teachers as well as parents will say, I want my child to share. But developmentally, they're not quite there yet. So really being able to have some of those conversations. This, uh, where the Vanderbilt.edu slash CEPHAL, there's some book nooks. So if you go on the CEPHAL website under practical strategies, there are lots of book nooks that have really fun ideas of things that you can do with children to support social emotional development. Okay. Here's one that if you have children who are like getting close to three or threes, or it's a family who has some older children at home, having a friendship kit is a really fun way to get younger children to start sort of developing those empathy skills and paying attention. To, like if somebody's crying, you see toddlers, a parent can drop a toddler off and that toddler's crying and others that are in there will get this awful look on their face and then they start crying sometimes. So that empathy thing is there. It's just building on that. So having a friendship kit, kit is a really fun way to, you know, where, where it would have little um, band-aids in it or a pack of tissues where they could give another child a tissue if they're crying. Those kinds of things helps build those skills. I want to just quickly say temperament's one of those things that we don't always think about, but that's huge. It's a huge piece of us knowing what our temperament is and what's easy for us and what's hard for us with other children. But um, So if you're one of those people who's really high energy and you have one of those children that they do not do anything quickly, <laughs> you know? So we are the ones who have to adapt, right? I mean, that sends that message to that child that you're, you're okay, that you're important, that you're who you are. So we really need to pay attention. And people in classrooms, I, did I put the continuum in your handout? Do I have that one in here? No, I didn't. But you can go online and just get, um, it, you know, you can put temperament in there and it gives you those same little continuums. Because what's nice to do in a classroom is literally look at yourself first and then rate the other children and just kind of chart it out and see which ones you're kind of most alike and which ones you're, you know, more different from. But sometimes the conflict comes, if you have teenagers, you know, because you're so much alike sometimes, not always the fact that you're so different. But really it helps us be more aware of the different children in the classroom and what their needs are. The other thing that affects relationships is those behaviors that push your hot buttons. And you notice it doesn't say those children. It says those behaviors that push your hot buttons. Because there are certain behaviors like whining or um, holding on to you, clinging, that really push your hot button. And if you really pay attention, it affects your interactions with that child or that parent. There may be a parent who just kind of pushes your hot button. So that, again, is that red flag we need to try even harder with those. Okay, so you've seen this quote a million times, but I think it's, it's very fitting for right now. There's no doubt that they may forget what you said, but, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I mean, think about when you think about your favorite teachers. You, you, everybody always has that favorite teacher, and almost always it's because of the way they made them feel, that they made you feel special and important. Okay, wow, finally we get to the second ingredient here. <laughs> okay, it's good that this recipe doesn't have a lot of ingredients, so, but each ingredient is very powerful. So just those responsive environments and how important, so if we think about those relationships, we have to be responsive, right? So setting up those environments for um, infants and toddlers that are important. I'm gonna show you just a little bit of this quickly because this is a parent. I forget your time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Two-step process. Um, a, actually a family dropping off a child and just look, think about what message your program sends to children and to families, okay? Because that's a big social-emotional one. 
Ima koji se je? Jele, ko je to pa? Pomolim se, ko je to pa? How are you? I was the pride of the year. Good? I took a little nap when I'm making the transition, leaving Christopher off at the daycare and I'm getting ready to leave. Um, I always feel my heart skip a little beat, but I know as soon as Nikki picks him up that it's going to be okay. How is he? How is he? Do you better now? Yeah, he's having no problem with his teeth. The simple act of Nikki asking for information sends a powerful message to the parents. She's very interested in Christopher um, and what he's doing, how he's developing. She listens to everything that I tell her. Bobby says that he doesn't like his waffle anymore. <laughs> so he's going to have toast for breakfast this morning. Oh, wonderful. With peanut butter. Mm. He wants toast with peanut butter? Sam, that is big now. He's just worried about peanut butter. Well, then, what is this for me, Harry? Over the weekend. Mmm, yum. I wasn't here yesterday, so I didn't get to know about that. Well, oh, that is new. So, did he have anything before coming this morning? So what message do you think that program sends? Welcome. Yeah. And so that's a good one for us to be reflective of. Just kind of think about, as a program, what message do we send to our children and families, as well as as a classroom, what, what message are we sending? And is it that the message we want to be sending? Okay. So routines. All of you know in infant toddler care that you spend most of your time on routines, right? Like feeding and diapering and those kinds of things. That's what makes up all the time. So often when we hear people say, I don't, it's just hard with all the children in here to have time to be responsive and to do one-on-one -on -one kinds of things. But if a child's diaper is changed six times a day until he's 30 months old, he will have had his diaper changed more than 5,400 times. Anything that happens to us 5,400 times is significant. So that means there were 5,400 opportunities to interact with that child one-on-one, -on -one, where it's not always easy to do the one-on-one, -on -one, that is. So, um, all right. There's also the, one of the cell practices, like you were talking about, is called diapering from that literacy, learning, and literacy. Well, there it is right there, sent on early literacy and learning. Um, so they, one of the little activities on the back is to have some kind of fun saying that every time you change the diaper, you say something fun so the child learns. They know that's coming, but that's really cute. Diaper change, diaper change, Keenan needs a diaper change. Off with the old, on with the new, Keenan no longer smells, be you. So you can see kids thinking that's funny. In addition to the fact that some kids really, uh oh, sorry really like the visual of knowing what's happening to them. So I'll never forget sitting in a um, center one time where there was a, a toddler sitting on the floor and he was playing and he had his back to the teacher and she was changing diapers and she walked up to him without, because she was watching some other kids, without saying a word to him. Now his back's to her and she picks him up and he's just completely startled because he had no idea she was coming. He picks him up and then she walks like this over to the table and then she's talking to kids that got into kind of a scuffle over here. So she's, you know, and I'm thinking, boy, through his eyes, he's probably thinking, what the heck just happened to me? And just those little things that, again, I don't think we consciously do them. We don't mean to. But when you're intentional, then you know to say to him. You call his name. You tell him you're coming, that you're changing diapers, those kinds of things. So sometimes some of those visuals help us as adults as well as they do children. Or, you know, just knowing kind of what the process is. And we talk about this often with older children. But this works really well for toddlers, too, to know what's coming. Okay. I want to show you. This is what one classroom did. Watch this little. So they... <laughs> She didn't rush her because she kept turning around, checking, you know, not quite sure she wanted to leave. She didn't rush her, but they had a routine that they did, and kids knew that. You know, we do these things in centers. That's a great thing to share at home for families, too. 
because it's a great literacy activity as well as just kids knowing what the expectation is. The routines again, sometimes toddlers really need to know the routine. That's kind of a lot, but the point is, if you have a if you've got a toddler who has a tough time in the morning, then maybe a schedule would really help. Okay. Arrivals and departures. This is one of those things that I'm sure you guys see all the time, but that for families, they don't often realize how that literally can make or break their child's day based on the way they leave their child in the morning. And so sometimes, I'll show you a little letter that we've done, but we'll have a special goodbye area and it's all the way across the room. So you can't walk in the room, like where you have to sign your child in or something, you have to come in the room and go all the way across to the room. So they can't just run in the door, sign and run out the door. And that special little goodbye area, parents know that's a special area to have some kind of routine. Maybe it's a butterfly kiss or maybe it's like that mom who literally would play something, play a little game with her child before she left every day. But there's some kind of routine so your child knows that that means you're leaving and that you'll be back later. So doing some of those kinds of things. We sometimes have sent letters home from the child to the parents just to say, you know, you're so special to me and I love being with you. And when you drop me off in a hurry, it really makes it hard for me during the day. So if you'll just take a few minutes, it makes my day go a whole lot better. So thinking about some of those kinds of things you could do that would support parents. Using first then is another thing that I think we do a lot, but to share that with parents, because that's a great thing to start with toddlers, where you do the first we do this and then we do whatever that activity might be. Okay. Um, another one, we it's really important for us to listen to what we say. <laughs> so that's such a good example, right? <laughs> But if we go back to poor little Luke, and you know, when we, we listen to what you say, truly, we say be gentle a lot. We say, or we hear people say calm down a lot, which to me is such a funny thing because I'm not even sure what that means as an adult. But we're saying calm down, calm down, use your inside voice, don't hit. So really, when we say those things, have we taught children what that means so they know how to respond to us? Otherwise, they can't meet the expectation because they don't even understand what be gentle means. There are lots of fun books. Um, Pat Them Gently is one that has like the textures in it so you can literally practice gently touching or have a stuffed animal and practice gently touching. But when we think about social emotion and supporting competence and confidence, what kinds of things can we do across children so we know that they understand us so they can meet that expectation and be more successful with that. Okay. In your packet, I put this voice volume chart because that's kind of a fun way because you can be quiet as a mouse or roar like a lion. So even little ones can start to understand that. So that you have that and then you have the quiet loud. I actually put the parent version of the quiet loud book nook because those are things you might read in a classroom but then there would be some activities you could share with families. One classroom even did a little felt mouse like right before the nap time so they would all have their little fe felt mouse to be quiet as a mouse before time. So lots of different things you could do with that and support. The other thing I, th I just wanted to throw in here too is can't suggest that the child lacks a necessary skill. Want suggests that, that the child has that skill but just is not using that skill. So if we're not sure then it's best to assume that the child can't do that and we want to try to make sure that we teach them what to do before we decide that, they're, that they just won't use that skill that they have. So give them the benefit of that. Okay, so this is what I heard in a toddler classroom the other day. I told you you could play for five more minutes and then you needed to clean up your toy. Well, she didn't say what's five minutes, but you could see her kind of go, she didn't have a clue what they were talking about when she said, I told you you had five minutes to clean up. So that's another one that I think sharing with parents too, because sometimes we say those things not thinking about the fact that they don't have a clue what that means. So we've got to do some other things that help them learn how much time there is there or, you know, the little um, timers or the little sand things, things that would give children visual cues so they can meet their question. Okay, one cup emotional literacy skills. So that's that hard part of really starting to try to understand some of those emotions that they're feeling and regulations um, helping infants 
learn to regulate and toddlers learn. And I, I mean this, you know, an infant who's understood and supported in his emotions, you see this all the time as a toddler who is better able to use words and gestures or you've taught them signs. They don't have the words yet, but they have signs so they can at least communicate. And then grows into a preschooler who has that competence and confidence and is more successful. So I gave you that sheet with the little songs on it. For infants and toddlers, just singing, they may not know what all those words mean, but the repetition of that and the more you talk about it, the more it has meaning to them. So those are some fun ways. And these, this is fun because it says if you're sad, you can cry a tear. If you're mad, use your words, those kinds of things. So it has actually what you can do. Okay. That's just another one. And then books. One thing that we tend to do, especially with younger ones, is think, ah, oh, this book's too complicated. We can't do this. And we don't want to have with lots of words. But there are some books like On Monday When It Rained that have a wide range of words in them. So going beyond mad, glad, sad is what I'm trying to say here. So introduce new words to them. And even if they don't get it, if we keep doing it, it will have meaning to them at some point. She, it reminds me of a colleague that I work with. Her little boy came home from, I can't remember how old he was, but he was little, and he sat at the table, and he went, oh, and he kept doing it. And they said, what are you doing? And he said, so embarrassed. And they said, what does that mean? And he goes, I don't know, but my teacher talked about it today. <laughs> but, but as a first step. So um, when I am, that's a, another but it's in English and Spanish, and it's a real simple book. But what's really cute about it, it says, when I'm happy, I smile. Because, you know, a lot of them just label emotions. But this actually says what I do. When I'm sad, I hug my bear. So those are great to have conversations. And on the CEPHAL website, there's a book nook for when I am. And it actually has a little pattern for how you can take a paper bag. And so this says, when I'm happy... And then under the flap, you put a picture of the child so they can make a face of what they do when they're happy. And then it's their own little book about what they do with emotions. Okay. Um, empathy. So their books, when we're showing empathy towards others, when we point out to toddlers when somebody's crying or something that they do to show empathy, that's how we really start building those, those skills. So that little, um, the stuffed animal up there with the, you know, wrapped his arm. So that was actually in a, it was a, just like a three, four-year-old classroom. But we, this was years ago, but so we took their favorite stuffed animal and just literally wrapped his arm with, you know, that wrap and put it where they always kept him and didn't say anything. And the kids came in. It took them a few minutes. But then they went over and they were like, what happened to Mandy? And we said, I don't know. What happened to Mandy? Well, they started coming up with all these stories. And we did nothing but wrap, wrap his leg. So they had had a bonfire at school like two weeks before that. And they literally, you know, of course, it, parents were really having to be careful with their kids because they were roasted marshmallows and things. So they decided that Mandy got too close to the fire and got burned with the marshmallow, you know, when they were doing marshmallows. So that they needed to take Mandy to the doctor. And so one of them was holding the doctor when the doctor said Mandy had to have a shot. <laughs> so the funny conversation was, well, you can go, we'll take, we'll go to McDonald's if you don't cry. <laughs> so you knew they had heard these conversations. And then one of them tried to say, you, you can have a, ha a hamburger or something. And one of the others said, but Mandy's, they were trying to say vegetarian, but it didn't come out. So then they said, well, you can have fish. I mean, they're in, I mean, literally for a month, this went on with, I mean, all we did was wrap and, and they, you know, it got old after a while, but just thinking of those little things you can do that really supported empathy and taking care of. And then you can really point out what they're doing. Bear feels sick. If you don't know that book, that's a great one for empathy. Another thing, so this is a great one to do at home as well as with younger children in the classroom, sort of the helping hand. So every time they help each other do something, the name doesn't go up there, but what they did. So you're really building on those skills of what you do to help each other. Okay, um, okay so, all right, we're kind of okay time-wise now. 
So the other thing is we want to start introducing, because biting comes up all the time, right? Um, being frustrated because I can't communicate. I'm trying to tell, I know what I want, but I can't get you to understand what I want. So really reading about, talking about, labeling, having conversations, supporting, comforting around all those emotional literacy skills, as we know, is really, really important to lay that foundation. And there's Mouse Was Mad is a really cute book because Mouse is really mad and then all the other animals try to tell him what he can do. Because I think mad is one of those things that based on our own experience with that, we sometimes make it sound like it's not okay to be mad and we want kids. That's a legitimate feeling, but it's what you do with that. So we want to start early sort of with that sort of thing. But um, movement-wise, Mouse Was Mad was fun because it's, you know, like the elephant tells him to stomp when you're mad and the rabbit tells him to hop so they can actually do all those kind of things in their life. Here's some more um, resources that you can use that are family tools so you can share information with families. So on the challengingbehavior.org website, they have some new resources called Backpack Series. They're for parents. A lot of people shaking their head. Some of those have some really good ideas in them. Um, not all, a lot of them are birth to five. Not all of them are. So you kind of have to read through and, and see what works. But then on the CEPHAL website, they're under family tools. There are some different articles like responding to your child's bite, and it has lots of good ideas in it. Probably not things I would just hand to parents because, you know, with all of us, people hand us stuff, and we have best of intentions, but they get stuck in a pile. So even bulletin boards, like when you walk in, you know, if your child bites, here's some things you can do, or in newsletters, or anything that we can get out to parents. Okay. <laughs> Two cups of patience. All right, because we're just starting to get into that um, being mad, being frustrated, trying to tell you stuff, seeing challenging behavior start to happen. So be sure to use the behavior has meaning brand, all right, because that's the big message here. So behavior communicates, right? So it's tr they're trying to tell us something. It's not always easy to figure it out, but they're trying to tell us something. So if we're really trying to support social emotional competence, we want to try to figure out what they're telling us. Otherwise, we respond to the behavior. So they're not getting their need met. So it's not gonna make a whole lot of difference. If we can figure out what they're trying to tell us and our response matches that need, then that's a whole different story, right? So, you know, we're trying to tell you something and we're usually trying to get your attention or get out of something we don't wanna do. So, right. I don't want to show you, this This actually is a, well, uh, no, let's do this one because this would be more typical center. Oh, okay. This is a great example of behavior has meaning. So watch Michael. So watch her too. Watch Ariana. But I'm not giving up.
No. <laughs> My fault. Okay, what was Michael trying to do there? What was he communicating? He wanted attention. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's true. But if you watched it longer, you can kind of figure it. Because did you see? I mean, he would look straight at her and throw it, <laughs> and sit there like. Hello. That didn't work. So if she had paid attention to him. And when she did pay attention to him, it changed his behavior completely. That's, that's all she had to do, but it kept escalating, and poor Ariana keeps getting in trouble for anything around Michael. And even the look on her face at one point is almost like she just gives up. I mean, I think it's really powerful that way because she's kind of like, I just give up here. I'm not, I'm not going to do anything. So sometimes I think when we have like a Michael, we forget about the impact that it has on the other children and what they're learning about interactions and what they're learning about each other and how to respond. So you kind of have to take that whole thing into consideration. I also think it's a great example of Michael has so learned, he didn't have a clue what it means to say, I'm sorry, but what he has learned is if I do it, I get to go back and do whatever I was doing. So those kinds of things when we start really even videotaping ourselves that's what helps me because it's hard when you're in the middle of it because i applaud her for letting us show this video <laughs> because when you're in the middle of it it's so hard to see those things and react so videotaping especially if there is a particular child or children that are challenging for you if you videotape yourself with them in several different situations and when is it good when does that behavior not occur so really looking at the times that it doesn't, what's the difference of when it does occur and when it doesn't occur? And are you doing something that's different? Because often we're the ones that go, wow, I, I really am keeping that behavior going by the way I'm responding to it. So with, she was complete, and she even said, she completely missed that he was just, he literally wanted her attention. And that's all he wanted. He just wanted her attention. So matching makes a big difference. Whether or not to give a child attention when they're asking for attention in a way that we don't want them yeah. to. Like when they're throwing things. Yeah. Do we ignore that behavior or do we give the attention? Because one of the, because like if we're giving them attention, are we telling them when you want something, you just throw things yeah. and then you get what you want? Yeah. That's a really good question. And it's hard to answer because not knowing this kid or not seeing what's happening. Because well, Yeah, with children. And so I'm going to answer with children yeah. in general. Because, you know, every child's so different. It's really hard to say anything unless you observe. And we know that you have to observe more than once, too, because you really have to start watching of when it happens, who's around, how they're responding. But you're right, in general, if he's seeking attention and he's getting negative attention, it doesn't matter, he's getting attention, right? So the behavior sometimes can escalate. But what we want to do is we know that he's seeking attention. So you go ahead and give him attention, but at the same time, you're teaching him a more appropriate way to ask you for attention. It's kind of like the Luke. He didn't know another way to do it. So does that mean it'll change immediately? No, but we keep trying to teach him or her a more appropriate way to, when you want attention, here's some things you can do. And then, yes, sort of, it, once you teach them those skills, then ignoring the throwing behavior because that child now has other skills he can use. So you want to reinforce that using those other skills. But, you know, and for some children, it'll work quickly. And for others, you have to keep practicing those skills because, you know, they're going to throw. And, I mean, they may be getting more attention just from just you when they're throwing things too so but really trying to figure out when they're doing it why they're doing it what they're trying to tell us and then can I teach them another a, a more appropriate way to get what they're wanting this child before you start the project or yeah. before something is occurring 
to try to cut it off before it gets to the Absolutely, because that's kind of anticipating ahead of right. time and then helping prepare that child right. a little bit while we're still trying to figure out what they're doing. But you can pretty much bet if a child keeps using a behavior over and over, something about that behavior is working for them. Right. Because if it's not working, they don't keep doing it. So the hard part is figuring <laughs> out what is working about that, that they keep doing it. But you can pretty much bet on if they keep doing it, something's working. Something's meeting a need somewhere for them in that. So, but yeah, possibly phase it right out of Yeah, yeah. But that's a great idea of like setting the stage ahead of time for that particular child to see if that might help the child. I have a child that doesn't transition well. Yeah, always a scene. It's always screaming, yelling, crying. And so the timer goes up. Yep. The warning occurs. In a few minutes, you're going to see the timer, and it's going to empty, and yep. then we're going to know we're moving on. Yeah. So that's a great example of matching the child and helping the child be successful. It's kind of like that temperament thing. So you know that child has a really hard time with transitions. And it could be, is it all transitions or is it just certain transitions? And then trying to figure out what is it about those transitions that different that it's different from the others. But for some children, it's truly any time they have to switch something, it's difficult for them. So figuring out how do I support that child to make it easier, yeah. Great example. Okay, so you've got the resources. Did they get around to everybody, just to glance at them? So what did you think about those? Did those look like something that might be useful? I think they have some ideas in them. It's like any kind of resource. They have ideas that just give us more <laughs> ideas of things that we might try, or that if you have a family that's really struggling with a certain routine, it would give you more ideas of, of things that you could suggest to them to try. Okay. okay. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Um, hmm. <laughs> Speaking of behavior here. So I think one important thing, it really is easier for us to react to a behavior than it is to sort of step back and really take the time to try to figure out, okay, what they're doing may be driving me crazy, but they're trying to tell me something. It, this behavior has some kind of meaning. And it is true, I think, that when we react, we do tend to focus on if, it, if we're frustrated, if we're angry, if we hadn't had any sleep, so our trigger is quicker around that behavior for that child. So really trying to slow ourselves down and not react to the behavior, but be proactive about that behavior and try to figure out what's happening there. Okay. So going back to that every child needs one person who's crazy about them. And that's especially true often for those kids with challenging behavior because they're not getting a lot of feedback from anybody in their life and they don't necessarily have that person who's crazy about them. So it may be hard for us, it may be a challenge for us. We may have to literally think as we walk in the door that morning, okay, I can do it, I can do it, and put supports in place for us. But it's so worth it for that child to have somebody who thinks they're special who is crazy about them. And sometimes we have to be that person for that child. So really thinking about the different children in the classroom and their social emotional competence. Okay, so the main ingredient, do you know what it is? So think about all the things we talked about. We know that the secret ingredient we were talking about was sort of that social emotional piece. What do you think the main ingredient is that truly our recipe for success won't work without it. So it's like trying to make a cake and not put some of the ingredients in there so there's no way it's going to like end up being a nice cake. What do you think the main ingredient is? Love? Huge. Yeah? Almost. Relationship. What did somebody say? Yeah, a person to do it. So it's you, <laughs> because especially with social emotional, those things don't just happen. If we go back to the beginning, when we think about how dependent an infant is on us for everything and how the way we respond to that infant lays that foundation for who they're becoming, what their, their expectations are, how they let us know what their wants and needs are. Those things we have to support. So it really is true. You are the main ingredient 
and parents are the main ingredients. So, but if we think about the time that, the number of hours that children are with us, as well as with parents, it doesn't matter whoever is with that child at that moment is that main ingredient for that child. So it just shows you how important you are again and how we have this amazing opportunity to really help children have those positive opportunities so they can develop that sense of competence and confidence that's so important as they move forward age-wise. Okay? okay, so that's my recipe for success. <laughs> So any questions or thoughts or things you want to share? So we did pretty good with the time to end it with time for questions. So anything? I have a question. Yes. I have a child who, not all the time, but if it's a chaotic breakfast, she'll always ask for one more specific thing. I know it's attention try to do other things, let's play this game right after breakfast. Well, can I have a half a peanut butter sandwich? Can I have an egg? Can I have my eggs this way? And occasionally I'll do it, and she'll say, I don't really want it. <laughs> so today I said to her, I'm sorry, but I've done this three times for you, and it really hurts my feelings, and I'd like you to sit there and try to eat. And I'm hoping that it doesn't happen again tomorrow, <laughs> but she kind of pushes my buttons that way. And see, that's where, so this is the hard part. Because that's <laughs> that consistency part, too. Because the second we let down and do it, then they're like, oh, that worked. Okay. <laughs> and even if they didn't want it or whatever, I'm going to do it again because if it is attention, mm -hmm. but if it's, if it's attention, then again, and I don't know what the situation is, but if it's attention, even doing some things about letting her help with some things, like help you as you're cleaning up or help you, that may kind of, because she'll feel special doing that or whatever, but it, the thing we have to really be careful with is that when we, and give in's not the right word, but when we respond in a way that they quickly go, whether it was negative or positive, ah, that kind of worked, then they're going to do it again. They're going to try it again. And that's why I'm trying to figure out what does she really want. If it's a she really didn't want the food because that's probably obvious because when you have given it to her, she doesn't want it. So that's not what she, it's not a child who you feel like, wow, she's really still hungry and I really need to do something. It's for some reason, it's attention or whatever that she's trying to get. So I would try and literally a lot of, of people will do like with, meals and stuff, you know, meal, however you do it, lasts from this time to this time, or when they're finished, you put your things away and you move on. You, it's not more food, it's not more whatever. So it's kind of that routine. So I think just even maybe having some visuals for everybody of what that routine is and what you do, but getting her to help you or trying other ways to give her some attention and, and not responding to her I want more, can I have another egg or whatever, because she's already finished, you know, you're finished, put your things away, so there's that start and end to that routine, but she was yeah. She actually peeling the eggs. Yeah. I want the eggs, I want to peel the eggs, and she peeled the eggs, and she was like, I don't want them. <coughs> yeah. And today with peanut butter, and I was like, yeah, you just need to sit up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. In that particular instance, would that be more beneficial to both of you to be able to say, well, I would rather spend time with you Let's go doing... Okay. Yeah, and I think that's that... Mm -hmm. ...that you need to spend time and she'll understand that. Yeah, it's that figuring out how to give her attention, meet that, but where she understands that too, you're right. Trying to, and that's, I guess, what I was trying to get at with that routine too. So you kind of learn the routine and then it is. So, but I'd rather spend time with you. Like first then almost, okay, first we'll do this. Then we can go read your favorite book together or whatever that might be. But yeah, I think that would be really important. And it's so hard. I think the, when we think about a recipe, because every child is so different and what works a couple of days and you're thinking, yay, it's finally working and we're seeing this behavior change. <laughs> then the next day it's like, okay, it's not working anymore. And they're going to test us. I mean, they're, you infants do that. It doesn't take infants long to kind of figure out, when I do this, this is the response I get. 
So, which is a good thing and can be a bad thing because we've also seen infants like try and try and try to pull an adult in and they finally just give up and you literally can see them give up. So that can be a good thing and a bad thing, but that's why I think we have to really pay attention mm -hmm. to what those needs and wants are and how, what our response is. So it's, it's so hard. I mean, early childhood people should be like, that should be like the biggest, bestest job ever, respected and everything, because it is so important what happens, but it's so hard also. All right, well, thank you guys. It was fun being with everybody. So.